If this morning you feel tired of your circumstances, if your circumstances are not favorable, or if you're in a place where you feel as if you could scream because of your circumstances, well then, this sermon is for you and I urge you to stay with me until the end of the message. And if you're not in that place or space, that you listen so that you may encourage someone else who might be struggling presently in their circumstances. So what I want to do today is to discuss our text is Ephesians chapter 6 verses 5 to 9 where Paul is addressing slaves and as we unpack this text we will find the necessary wisdom to deal I, I believe with our own situations. Now back in the Apostle Paul's day there were some estimated 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire. That's approximately the population of the Republic of South Africa. And they included laborers, these slaves, and educated people as well, like doctors and teachers and administrators. In fact, the largest portion of Roman society was made up of slaves, and that's important for us to understand as we look back in history. For us, the thought that someone may own another person is simply offensive. It's a crime against human dignity. It's unconstitutional. However, that was not the world view in the ancient world. It was not the world view when Paul wrote the letter to the Ephesians. And what is interesting is that Paul does not tell believers who are slaves to fight against the system of slavery. He doesn't do that, and, and that's phenomenal from our perspective. And if we believe the Bible is normative, then it gives us direction in our present day. Paul actually tells the slaves to work harder than ever before within the system, to be the best possible slaves within the system. And so there's no rah-rah about bringing a new world order into place where everyone is equal from Paul's side. There's no instruction from his side for a rally or protest action, or there's no focus, in other words, uh, on a direct fight with the world structures. Instead, Paul does something completely refreshing, which we must take note of. He turns the fight against slavery inward onto the one who is the slave, inward onto the one who is the oppressed. And he urges slaves to change their inner horizon and this will be the challenge to you as we go along to ask you the question how does your inner horizon look and will you change it what Paul does is he liberates the slaves in other words in their hearts from slavery he does not liberate them from physical slavery he tells them to no longer live to please their masters here on earth, but they must now live to please Christ. The horizon is, in other words, shifted from an earthly master to a heavenly master, and that heavenly master's name is Jesus. So when Paul addresses the slaves in the Christian fellowship, he mentions Jesus Christ over and over and over again, because Jesus is the key to true freedom of any nature. If you are in a circumstance now where you need freedom, the key to that is to change your horizon to be that of Jesus Christ, not the world. Listen to carefully to what Paul says uh, in our text. I'll read it to you and then just focus on the amount of times that he repeats Christ. Slaves, he says, be obedient to those who are your masters according to flesh with fear and trembling, in sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not by way of eye service as people pleases, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will render service as to the Lord, and not to people, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, he will receive this back from the Lord, whether slave or free. Those are phenomenal words, and I hope you picked up the amount of times he's referring the slaves to make their lives centrally move around Christ. 
Now this text is interpreted by John Stott in a way that I just love. Uh, John Stott is a commentator and I'm going to read to you what John Stott says, a short paragraph, but I think he nails it, John Stott. And why I like it is if you listen to the quote in um, consideration of the text today, it must change your life. Listen to this. John Stott says, the Christ-centeredness of this instruction, that's now Paul's instruction to the slaves, is very striking. The slave's perspective has changed. His horizons have broadened. He has been liberated from the slavery of men-pleasing into the freedom of serving Christ. His mundane tasks have been absorbed into a higher preoccupation, namely the will of God and the good pleasure of God. Christ. His mundane tasks have been absorbed into a higher preoccupation, namely the will of God and the good pleasure of Christ. You know, we learn wonderful truths here. Firstly, that we should be very cautious in our quest to become content by directing our hearts at changing the world or at changing our own circumstances. We should be cautious because very often some circumstances cannot be changed immediately. And most importantly, it is a changed heart that brings contentment, not changed circumstances. I know many of us have to hear that this morning. It's a changed heart that brings contentment, not changed circumstances. Do you not think you are going to be content once your circumstances change? If you're not already content in your present circumstances, however bad they may be. Let me put it another way. If you are a moody person at present, despondent, critical, complaining. If you've got racist statements, wishing for better days, dwelling on past days, unforgiving. If you're bitter and unhappy because of your present circumstances then there is still a learning required for you, regardless of how much you may know your Bible and theology. You see, there's a, a transcendent reality for Christians that must be learned. In other words, a reality that exists over and above our physical existence here on earth. It's something that must be acquired, that must be taken hold of. It's in the space of deep maturity as a Christian. I love the way Paul puts it in Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 to 13. Listen to this. Not that I speak from need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with little, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. It is Christ who strengthens us. So bottom line, direct your Christianity at changing your own heart. Move your horizons to Jesus Christ. And be that beautiful Christian who blooms in the middle of the captivity of your circumstances. Who, who blossoms in adversity. Be a testimony to the fact that Jesus Christ is the one who sustains you, keeps you, and blesses you, whether you have much or little, whether it's going well or if it's going bad. Listen to this, that the world is changed. It's changed not by changing the external, but changing the internal, from inside out, not from outside in. Christ changes your world by changing your heart. Let me repeat that. Christ changes your world by changing your heart. This is how slavery is overcome, how racism is overcome, how tribalism is overcome. How you give your enemy a glass of water when he's thirsty. That's how that happens. How your love in your marriage is restored, whether that love is reciprocated or not. For this to happen, for your heart to change, and thereby your world to change, you must engage Christ. You must engage Him. 
He must become your horizon. And when I say engage, I do not mean on a low level. I mean an absolute engagement. Seek Him with the purpose of knowing Him better. Live your life in such a make the changes that direct your life to serving Him, not men in this world. May His opinion, in other words, be the opinion that moves you, not the opinion of men or women in this world. I close. I, I recently listened to a webinar of a theological faculty. Uh, and, and the webinar dealt with discrimination and the eradication of discrimination. Two hours plus. But sadly, in the webinar, near no mention of Jesus Christ or the Holy Spirit. No mention of the centrality of Jesus Christ in transforming the heart to the Holy Spirit. Nothing about transforming society inside out through the gospel in my own heart. One heart at a time. Nothing of that. It seems to me that many academia and many Christians have become ashamed of putting Christ in the center. Ashamed of, of raising him up and speaking of him with absolute gusto. Ashamed of the exclusivity of Jesus Christ as the only way unto salvation. Ashamed of, of Christ's supernatural but not always scientifically measurable power to change the impossible. May that not be so for you and me that we are ashamed of Christ. Please do not be ashamed of Jesus Christ. He's the only way to salvation. No other religion saves. And Jesus is your only hope. He's the only one who can change your heart and bring you into a place of contentment that you blossom in the middle of your circumstances, highly contented. May you engage Christ. Go broken. Go honest. Go alone. Go ready to listen. Go vulnerable. Go expectant. Go ready to change. Face the glory of God which exposes the hidden motives of the heart, even though it be painful. And do not relent. Know this, that Jesus will change your heart. Jesus will change your world and Jesus will change the world. May God bless you so. Let us pray. Father, we ask this morning that Jesus Christ would be our vision, that our lives would be directed to Him, that we will break the bounds of our earthly existence and reach to a heavenly existence that we bring into this world by action. Perfect our love, Lord, so that we may do the deeds that are necessary for the world to know that we are your disciples. Bless us and keep us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.